Hey, let's talk about what's happening. Well, the calendar only goes to the 24th, so uh, tomorrow must be the last day. Yes. Let's see, this is maybe 29th. Could you explain like the starting steps to the last question on the lecture set? Technically, that's not how I think the exact question. But um, the 28th lecture set? Yeah. Yes. Number seven. Um, I assume it's just part D. Um, Perhaps I should think again. Ah, okay. This is the wrong one. This doesn't start with. Alright, so they started out at some age. Mm -hmm. And it really doesn't matter what. Just stick a number. So you start out when they're 10 years old. Be Sue and Lou. So Sue goes and comes back, and she is she ages five years, I think. And Lou ages whatever that is. I'll just make up a number. So from this information, you know, I think in part C, if I saw correctly, that you figure out from the Earth's point of view, or sorry, planet X's point of view. From Lou's point of view. From, from Lou's point of view, how far Sue went and came back. So you have some idea of the distance that was traveled. Now Lou's going to travel to the exact same planet. And when he comes back, there's going to be uh he's going to be three years older. Yeah. So whatever this is. Yeah, with some L because it's going to be blue string. And so I know that however Lou is, that is three years older than oops, minus three. Uh, it would be Sue's age. I have two unknowns here. I don't know uh, how long Lou has gone from Lou's point of view. And I don't know how fast Lou is going to travel. Mm -hmm. So I need a second equation because I have two unknowns here. Because this is directly related to how the speed. I do know how far Lou is going to travel from Sue's point of view. And so I know that that distance is going to be equal to gamma times the distance from the rocket's point of view, or I guess it'd be Lou's point of view. 
I know that. And let's see if I introduce a new unknown there. That's the essence of the setup. I feel like I'm missing one other key piece of information here. Let's see, we know how far away it is. We know. <coughs> Does the distance blue travels? I feel like there's a piece of information that I've skipped over all month. Thank you. All right. Uh, rocket, five years. You know how fast she went. Um, okay, so planet X is where they start. Travels would be oh would be the time that he is gone divided by his speed. Oh no, I don't want to use it. Would be the speed he's traveling times half the time he's gone. Which I guess I played as an X right there. There we go. Three equations, three unknowns. And solve. Oh. I probably should have used T instead of an X for time, but oh well. questions? <coughs> okay. Let's talk about all the things that are wrong with the stuff that I haven't directly taught you, but uh, are implied from the stuff, or eventually you get to from the stuff that I taught you. There are some problems with classical physics. Now, in the late 1800s, it was thought that they had almost wrapped physics up. They were very close to basically having everything except for more significant digits and all their measurements. Special relativity shows up, general relativity shows up, and quantum physics shows up. So here's the problem. Some of the problems that could not be answered except by some incredible new breakthrough. If you take a black box, this is known as black box radiation, and sometimes this is black box is written as a single word. Basically, a black box is, if it's truly black, it's not admitting any light. Really. Basically, we, Ali's sweatshirt is red because light bounces against it and the light wave that comes off of it is red. Black things, the light hits it and gets absorbed. So you take a black box, it basically is a cavity inside, and uh, ideally no light is bouncing off of it. Any radiation coming from it is coming from within. You take the black box, you put a hole in it, and you're looking at the radiation coming out of the hole. Now, as you heat it up, the radiation is going to change inside. And you get a relationship of the intensity of the radiation coming outside versus wavelength. 
Now, classical physics makes a prediction, and the class, there are actually two predictions. One of the predictions, it kind of looks like this, like that, which obviously doesn't work particularly well for anything beyond the peak. There's another prediction called the Rayleigh Jeans Law, which does that. So there's a decent prediction for low wavelengths and a decent prediction for high wavelengths, and there's even a, a pretty decent prediction for the peak, although it's more empirical. But looking at the green line that I just drew, think about it, if you've got a, the analogy works, if you have a battle route, so a road attached to a wall and you're going up and down like this, if you increase the frequency, are you putting more energy into it or less energy? More. Yeah. So, and also recognize there's a relationship between wavelength and frequency, because I know that the speed of the wave, well, we're talking about electromagnetic radiation, is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. So as the wavelength gets smaller, the frequency gets bigger. So this would correspond to high energy over here. So what this is saying, the green line here, is that as you get to higher and higher energies, the intensity goes off the scale. It becomes infinitely big. Now, if that truly was what happened, then, well, all life as we know it would be gone. Extreme radiation poisoning. Or life would have evolved completely differently. This is known as ultraviolet catastrophe. It's common enough phrase for me to write it down. So, obviously, we're still here, enough to talk about it, so ultraviolet catastrophe doesn't work there. So what's going on? Well, Max Planck, excuse me, uh, or Planck, if you want to anglicize it. He's got like six names. Uh, Max Planck comes up with this, and the first thing he does is comes up with an equation that fits this, fits the actual curve. He doesn't know why, but he comes up with an equation that works. This is known as phenomenological physics. You basically have got theoretical physics, experimental physics, and phenomenological. The theorists basically start from what they hope are basic principles, and they make predictions. The experimentalists that was a theorist. The experimentalists come along and they go, oh, here's the prediction. Let's test to see if we actually get what's predicted to come up with support for what the theorists come up with. And the phenomenological physicists basically look at the data and they go, huh, let's see if we can make something fit this. So he comes up with the following equation. There's several different forms of this, so uh, I'll probably just pick the one with wavelength in it. I know I have an I there, I'm about to use an R. Gradients related to the intensity over there is equal to 2 pi hc squared over lambda to the fifth e to the hc over lambda kt. It's a lambda. So I can do that better. Lambda kt one to one. So he comes up with this, 
and it fits. So I mean, because he basically wouldn't have published it if it didn't fit. But he had no idea why this actually worked or not. And so then he spent the next couple of years trying to figure out, all right, basically trying to rationalize it. And he came up with this idea that light is not a continuous spectrum. That there are only certain values that will work for it. And so he establishes the idea that light is quantized. Does quantized uh, in discrete packets. So if I've got in classical physics, light could be say from here to here. Uh, in quantum physics, that means that light, some value of light as a location or energy, exists in very discrete values. Is there anything in between? No. Now I say it hesitantly because there's some games you can play where it might appear so, but no. Well, if you think about it, if I've got the function of e to the negative x, that function looks like that, where it shoots off to infinity. If any value, so if I found the area under this curve, so if I found what this area is, the area is infinite. But if there's certain values not allowed, such as I can only have values of x that are integers greater than zero, so one, obviously, one and upwards, that means I'm cutting out this whole section right here, which shoots off to infinity, and I now have a finite value. So instead of having this thing go off to infinity, instead of having this infinity shooting out there, there is a finite amount of energy. I will spare you from that derivation. Uh, Dr. Paul? Yes? What are the, the power thing by the lambda and the e? This right here? Yeah. HC divided by lambda kt. And is that one for the lambda? A subscript? Yeah. Uh, oh, that's lambda to the fifth power. Okay, thank you. Now there are other variations, some in terms of frequency and some in terms of set of radiance. You get spectral radiance and spectral intensity and there's, there's a slew of words that could be thrown into this. Question about that graph with the e to the negative x. Yep. Is that section going to the negative side? Because you said anything greater than zero. And you From one down. onwards. So one and up. So anything greater than one. Yep. Okay. And the, the analogy I'm doing it would be any whole number greater than one. But we still get a finite area. Now, in this equation here, we get this value of h. This is known as Planck's constant. And it is an incredibly small amount. And somewhere I'm going to have it written down so I don't have to go off of memory. Here we go 6.626. Times 10 to the negative 34th. It's a turning number. Meter squared kilograms per second. So these are very small discrete packs. This is giving you some idea of. Uh, sort of the scale we're talking about here. So this is not something that we would be able to measure directly, at least not at that time. Other than the fact that it works for 
what we're seeing here. Is K also a constant? Uh, yes, K is Boltzmann's constant. It's value. One point three eight zero six four eight five two times ten to the negative twenty third meters squared kilograms per second squared kelvin. To the twenty what? <coughs> negative twenty twenty third. And does the Blake's constant have more numbers after the 626? You just didn't add them? I just didn't write them down. But there are them. Yeah. 07004 probably still goes on. Now, to give you some idea, we're talking 10 to the negative 34th in those units. In SI units, there's something which is still roughly in the same order of magnitude. There's something known as Planck time and Planck distance. Uh, there are some theorists that say that Planck distance is the smallest increment of distance. Planck time is the smallest increment of time. Others interpret it as in our rules of physics work until you get below Planck distance or Planck time. <coughs> So if light is quantized, why can't time be quantized? I mean, it might seem like it's smooth, but if you think about a, a movie, you're watching a movie and it looks like there are people moving on the screen, but you're actually seeing one still frame after another still frame after another still frame. All right, so this was uh, turn of the century, around 1900. It's a more specific date, but not coming at the moment. Also, in the first 20 years, we have another 